Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Today, we're talking about the state, and to help us deal with this question, we have Ben Glineski, who is the National Secretary of Socialist Appeal, the British section of the International Marxist Tendency. Ben, great to have you here. Thanks for having me back on. So I'm not going to waste any time. What is the state? Well, when people think of the state, they sometimes think of this sprawling mass of state institutions like healthcare, education, the Department of Work and Pensions. But really, the essence of the state is armed bodies of men. Right. That is to say, the courts, the prisons, the army, the police, because those are the things that really back up those other institutions that we see. Without Mm. that central pillar, you wouldn't really have much of anything else. Yeah, rough men with a monopoly on violence. Exactly that. It's, It's those armed bodies of men and the bureaucracy that manages them. Okay. And why does this apparatus of armed men exist in the first place? Uh, What's it for? Well, the point of it is to preserve the the status quo, the existing situation, the the defense of private property. That is essentially what the monopoly on violence that the state has is for. It's, It's to maintain in power a very small group of people who own most of the wealth, the biggest businesses and so on, and and maintain their power against the vast majority of people who don't really own anything. Obviously, we all own the clothes on our back and a, a bicycle maybe and a few books or whatever it is, but we don't own businesses or anything really that we can survive on other than our capacity to work. So that's the vast majority of people. That is the working class. Uh, and, and they are set in opposition under capitalist society to the ruling class, the ones who own the businesses and the land and so on. The armed bodies of men are required to maintain the wealth and the rule of that tiny minority, that ruling class. Yeah, the, the point is that the state is often seen as something that stands above society. You mentioned all these conflicts between classes, for example, different elements within society, and the state is portrayed as this thing that stands above everyone, a neutral arbiter between all the competing interests in society. But that's not true. As I said, the state is the in defense of a particular class interest in society. It doesn't stand above it. It acts very much as a weapon in the hands of the ruling class. Well, I guess the point is that without some way to enforce their claim over the means of production, over private property, this tiny minority would be immediately overthrown because they're hugely outnumbered and people would not unjustly say, well, what gives you the right and the privilege to hold all this power and wealth? So they need some way to maintain class peace. Otherwise, you just have constant strife and conflict. Exactly. And they need to preserve a monopoly on the right to use violence, which is what the state is. Because if everybody had the legitimate right to use violence, then they're they're vastly outnumbered. The majority of people would be able to, to overthrow them and restructure society. And so it's very important to them to maintain that monopoly over the armed bodies of men. But practically... How does the state defend private property? Because it's not as though every second of every day people are being physically beaten into into line by policemen to make sure that they aren't raiding the mansions of the wealthy. So it seems that it must be a bit more sophisticated than that. Yeah, that's right. And there's lots of different mechanisms by which the state is, is tied to the interests of the capitalist class. So if you take law, for example... Even some of the most fundamental laws, the most fundamental legal rights that people have, like human rights, there is a human right to private property, but there is not a human right to food or fresh water or housing. So what that shows is that the law, which is supposed to be this thing that equally governs absolutely everybody. It's blind, right? It's blind and it's supposed to provide justice and so on. Actually, inbuilt into it is this inequality. It's it's. It's built, it's specifically designed to protect the rights of people who have a lot of property and not to protect the rights of people who don't. Hmm. Can you demonstrate um, that inequality in action? Yeah, well, for example, think about the way that the law is enforced. There are laws governing all kinds of things, all kinds of crimes, for example, but they are not all enforced in the same way against the same people. Take financial crime as a good example. Right. 
I mean, I, I was getting involved in politics around 2009, 2010, just in the wake of the 2008 crash. And what came to light at that time was the extraordinary criminality of bankers and, and other people who almost, I think, one person was prosecuted. Millions of people lost billions of dollars in that crash which was a crisis of the capitalist system. It was not caused by greedy bankers or people breaking the law. Nevertheless, there was a lot of that going on, and it all came to the surface at that time. No one was prosecuted. Financial crime, crime that affects the rich, is not pursued. Or take, take international crimes. Look at what's going on in the Middle East right now. What has been going on in the Middle East for decades, the repeated violations, the trampling all over of international law by the Israeli state, has been completely ignored. No one has ever been brought to justice for that. And it's because Israel, the Israeli state, is an ally of the United States. The US, which has used its veto on the UN Security Council to veto over 50 resolutions condemning Israel, which just goes to show that the so-called institutions of international law are completely toothless. They're like an umbrella with holes in. They're useless precisely when they're needed. Exactly. That's right. And, and so that's the point. Even if the law were genuine in its equal treatment of everyone and justice for everyone, which, as I've already explained, it's not. Even if it was, the way in which it is enforced is not even done in, a, in an equal way. It's done in a way that supports the wealthy and the powerful and not the rest. Can we also, as another example, touch on the comparison between the way that serious financial crime is treated as opposed to, say, benefit theft? Exactly. And, and what causes greater loss? What causes more harm right it's the serious financial crime i mean a lot of the time um, many of the crimes that are committed by the wealthy if they come with a fine that's not really punishment at all because if you're talking a fine ten thousand pounds and you're a wealthy banker or you're a celebrity or you're the head of industry that's back of the sofa money but an ordinary person that's ruinous that's right and it's because the state is not supposed it's not designed to stand above society and treat everyone equally. It is designed to be a weapon in the hands of the, of the rich and powerful. And also the armed bodies of men that fundamentally make up the state and its oppressive apparatus, they distill the prejudices of capitalist society. Much has been made in the last few years of how racist and sexist and homophobic the police are, for example. That's right. Those... Th those people who are doing the enforcement of these of these laws do fully absorb and are brought up in and are trained in and are completely enveloped in the ideology, the ideas, the attitudes, the prejudices of the dominant class, the capitalist class. If you take, I mean, it's for example, judges are the ones who enforce these laws, right? Who pass sentence, pass judgment on on people who have uh, broken the law. Sixty five percent of them currently attended private school 7% of the of the population attended private school so over 70% of them attended one of two universities in britain uh oxford and cambridge they are fully enveloped in the in the world in the outlook of the of the elite of the privileged and of the ruling class many of them are lords for example uh they have no connection to the working class, the majority of people, they are part of the ruling class. You could say the same for senior police officers who are often knights or dames of the realm. You can say the same also for the politicians who make the laws, not just the people who enforce them. Rishi Sunak is the wealthiest prime minister that Britain has ever, ever had. His cabinet is something like 65% privately educated, Oxbridge educated. Yeah, stop with millionaires. That's right. It's a, it, it, is a, it is a very obviously ruling class government and you can say the same for other countries it's quite clear that it was not possible to become president of the united states unless you are a billionaire or have the backing of billionaires i, I don't have the statistics to hand but it is a fact that over the last however many years the winner of the u.s presidential election has been the candidate that's had more money backing them mm-hmm it's explicitly a system, obviously a system, that is tied to wealth. It's tied to the wealthy and the rich. Um, <clears throat> and it's not even just the politicians. It's also the civil servants, the permanent secretaries, for example, the heads of the civil service. All of them 
take the Home Office, for example, which is responsible for, for governing for, for yeah, the government of the police. The head of the civil service responsible for the police, responsible for the Home Office, for the last 150 years has always been from one of two universities, Oxford and Cambridge, with one exception, who went to Edinburgh University. 60% of these heads of the civil service all went to private, right now, all went to private school. They are all schooled in this way. And, th and this is just the kind of indirect molding of the state apparatus to align with the views and the outlook of the ruling class. There's also much more direct bribery right. of politicians, of civil servants, of, of functionaries of the state who, and it's an absolutely notorious thing that everybody knows about, it's in the media all the time, the revolving door between the public and private sectors. The civil servants who are responsible for regulating private companies move from those, if, if they do a good job, not regulating too hard, if they do their job to the satisfaction of those private companies, they do their job for the government to the satisfaction of the private companies, they're guaranteed a job with that private company afterwards. And obviously key sectors of the economy will pay a huge amount of money to ensure that they get policies out of governments that are favorable to them. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is the single biggest lobby in the US. And in 2022, so bearing in mind, this is obviously in the aftermath of the, the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic, it spent $373 million on lobbying. And what's the purpose of lobbying? It's to get favorable policies, to get tax breaks, to get contracts from the states. So the capitalists, even when they're not elected, they can use their financial clout and their political connections to manipulate the state from the outside. Yeah, exactly. I mean, lobbying is just a sanitized word for very open and, and explicit bribery of yeah. the government. Um, and and yeah, it's, it's everywhere. And I think everybody has an, an understanding of this to a greater or lesser extent that that if you have money and power, the government is going to listen to you. Yeah. And if you don't, then they have no particular interest or need to. Well, it's funny. I remember when Donald Trump was running in 2016, I think it was. And he, in the course of one of the presidential debates, basically said, look, guys, I can get th things done because I'm rich. I'm really rich. Yeah, I know how this system works. I know how to get things done on Capitol Hill because I'm really rich. I've been doing it for years. And I think that that, that honesty, that kind of cynical, um, you know, grifting honesty actually struck a bit of a chord with yeah. a layer of the American population that was sick of being lied to by these, you know, um, more clean and respectable politicians who concealed their connivances with uh, private interest behind a veneer of respectability. Mm, that's true. And this is I think this is a really crucial point to understand that the state as it exists today is is tied by a thousand threads to the interests of the ruling class. It's not just this or that politician who might be a little bit corrupt, who might be slightly too closely linked to this or that company. The whole apparatus from the judges to the police to the heads of the army to the politicians and the civil service, they are all explicitly and directly through bribery, lobbying, whatever, linked to the ruling class, and also indirectly through their education, their background, their upbringing, they are all taught and imbued with the prejudices of the ruling class and, and its outlook and ideology. Well, I suppose an immediate question that occurs is why do we, as in the masses of working and ordinary people, put up with all this? Yeah. Well, that is the question, and it's kind—it's of, always been the case. As as long as the state has existed in one form or another, you look back and you realize it's 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 a tool to preserve the rule of a tiny minority over the vast majority. So, why do people put up with that? Well, there have been different reasons over the course of human history. If you look at the the feudal kings, for example, they said that they ruled by divine right. It was mm. God's will that they were in charge, and therefore you couldn't question it. And so religion was actually a really important part of the state. And in some countries today, that remains the case. Actually, including Britain, where the religious leaders, the bishops, are part of the state apparatus mm -hmm. in the House of Lords. Yes. So there's an element of that there. But that gives you a bit of an idea of how they preserve the, the, the existence of the state and its legitimacy in the eyes of many people. 
it is through various different forms of mysticism, whether that's religious or whether, for example, you dress up your judges and lawyers in wigs and gowns and get them to talk Latin and they sound very, uh, very mystical. Or, in this country, for example, you use the monarchy, the right. pomp and the ceremony and the, the majesty of the whole thing to, to disguise what the state really is, which is this, this brutal weapon of class rule, but you dress it up in a, in a crown and some fancy clothes and, and say, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a, a nice embodiment of our nation? When in actual fact, it's, it's, it's just a, a club that's being used to beat the rest of us. But it relies on that mysticism. That's the main point. Well, regarding the monarchy, Walter Badshop was very honest and upfront about this in a very good book called The English Constitution, where he openly and explicitly says the purpose of the monarchy is essentially to provide a distraction, a glitzy circus, um, to obfuscate the real workings of British capitalism and to keep the masses distracted and to serve as an untouchable, aloof embodiment of the whole nation. Yeah, that's, that's exactly its role. And in one form or another, all the state institutions are wrapped up in something of that kind. In the US, the slogan of the police is to protect and serve. In Britain, the police is supposed to be based on uh, an idea known as policing by consent, mm. community policing. We're, we're just citizens in uniform. We're not something separate to the majority of people. This is the mythology that is created around these kind of institutions. And, and it suits the ruling class very well. That's why they promote it. That's why they do it. Because, I mean, even, even the, the concept of the very limited form of democracy that you have under capitalism is designed for that exact same reason. We have certain democratic rights and freedoms. We have the vote, for example, universal suffrage. But none of that actually fundamentally affects the fact that a tiny number of people own the vast majority of wealth in the country. Right. You can elect whatever government you like. You can have a demonstration or a street protest. You can publish whatever you like on the internet. It doesn't affect that fact. And as long as that fact of class society is not affected actually it's very helpful to have these methods by which people can blow off steam or you don't like this government you don't like a, a democratic government in the u.s for example vote for the republicans instead then you don't know republicans vote for the democrats or or even these days in britain labor and the tories there's nothing between them no so pete at the moment in britain people are fed up with the tories so uh so the ruling class is getting is actually explicitly getting behind at least a lot of them, a big wing of them, getting behind Keir Starmer. Oh, vote for Keir Starmer, vote for the Labour Party, because he's something different to the Tories. But in actual fact, his policies will not affect the rich and the powerful in any way. He will do their bidding in exactly the same way. So it's this kind of smokescreen, which uses the democratic rights that we have and we need to defend wherever they're under threat, as they are in many places in the world. But they don't fundamentally change anything. Uh, and, and that is the role of the state. The state is designed in that way. And that's why people put up with it, because of this mysticism and all this stuff that's thrown in there, all this dust that's thrown in their eyes. And didn't Lenin also make the point that the bourgeois democratic republic is the ideal state form for capitalism? Yeah, and this is the exact reason why he said that, because you can get, in a bourgeois democratic republic, you can get annoyed at this or that politician or this or that party, uh, and you and you can get rid of them uh, and bring another one in without it affecting the fundamentals of the capitalist system. You can even have a separation of powers and the, the executive held to account by the judiciary or by the legislative, for example, and hauled over the coals. You can have impeachments, for example, or, or whatever it is. And it looks like, oh, yeah, this is democracy at work, holding everyone to account. But then you take a step back and you realize you still can't pay your bills and you still can't pay your rent and your kids still go to terrible schools, and you can't get proper health care, none of that changes, irrelevant of who's impeached or which party's in power or whatever else. This demo the, the democratic rights that we have are insufficient, and they're, they're hugely limited under capitalism. How do we build communism? 
Issue 43 of In Defense of Marxism, the IMT's theoretical magazine, is out now. Link in the description. And it aims to answer this question. There's a piece on the trials and tribulations of building the planned economy in the Soviet Republic, an article on the revolution in Soviet theatre, and another on the tragic lessons of the working class's defeat in Germany in 1923. Pick up your issue today. So... I suppose to round off this discussion, we have to ask ourselves, what's the alternative? If the capitalist state really is this monstrous, mystified weapon of class rule, how do we get rid of it, I suppose, or how do we overcome it, um, and what do we replace it with? Well, that is the main question, and what we, what we have to understand, first of all, is that you can't take over the capitalist state machine and wield it in the interests of a different class. Mm -hmm. This state apparatus, the, the bourgeois state apparatus, is tied, as I said, by a thousand threads to the interests of the, of the ruling class, of the capitalist class. It is built, owned, and operated by them. And if you try to take that over, if you try to replace this or that civil servant or, or win this or that elected position, you're only going to get thrown backwards. All throughout history, every example of left-wingers trying to take over the existing state apparatus and wield it for their own purposes has come crashing down and ended in disaster in many cases. So that's not the approach that communists use. What we are interested in is building an alternative workers' state, a workers' democracy, uh, which actually allows for real decision-making by the majority of people. I said before that the democratic rights that we have under capitalism are, are limited, they don't actually affect the way that we live our lives day to day. But if you take examples of workers' democracy in, for example, the Occupied Factories movement that swept Latin America, uh, in Venezuela, for example, in Brazil um, in the 2000s, what you had there was a whole, uh, a whole raft of examples of workers, workers' councils in these factories taking control of those factories and, de and deciding everything, like pay differentials, for example, how much they got paid, where the investment should be, what should be produced, how the shift patterns would work, and so on. They took those decisions that actually affected their day-to-day -day lives. That's real workers' democracy. In Britain, in 1926, there was a general strike. And strike committees were formed to coordinate the strike. Obviously, in a general strike situation, the whole country is shut down. Everything stops. The transport of food, hospitals, petrol stations, everything was shut down. Some of those things needed to continue to work so that people could survive during the general strike. And so the strike committee, I'm thinking about the northeast of England as the example here, the strike committee in the northeast issued permits to ambulances, for example, you can go to a petrol station and you will get uh, fuel or certain lorry drivers who were delivering food to certain working class neighborhoods or whatever it is. The strike committee decided who got the food, when they got it, how much they got. And this was obviously an elected strike committee elected yes. by the working class. That was an organ of workers power. That wasn't taking over parliament. That was the creation of a strike committee. A similar thing happened in May 68 in France, actually, or in Paris anyway. You had um, workers controlling the in and out flow of goods. You had workers at the petrol stations, as you say, controlling access to fuel. You had workers control the media for a, for a period. Um, so you can see the embryo of how workers' power could emerge in the context of struggle and lay the basis for a different form of state. That's right, and that's the point. That's what we're fighting for, uh, is, a, is a worker's state, a worker's democracy that, that could operate in this kind of way. Can I ask a quick question? Because I know some people would ask, well, this is all very nice, but um, you're still going to have criminals, you're still going to have disorder. So, all right, you're talking about managing sections of the economy, but what about policing? Um, surely we can't just do away with the police or society would turn into chaos and it'd be like the purge. People would be running around killing each other and stealing things and breaking into houses and, and what have you. So what do we say to that? Yeah, well, let, let me give you an interesting example that's quite recent, actually, from the BLM movement in the United States. 
a few years ago. Obviously, that was provoked by the actions of the police in Minneapolis, which was kind of the epicenter of that movement. And what happened there is that the police were so hated, completely lost all the respect, all authority with people. They were they were driven from the streets of the of the city. But as you say, you can't abolish all crime overnight or or whatever. And so what happened was that the the local chapter of the NAACP stepped in to organize policing, I suppose, although they didn't call it that, but it was they were armed, armed patrols to maintain order, yes, protect people's livelihoods and their houses and things like this of the local areas of yeah. the local neighborhoods and, they, and neighborhood militia essentially that's yeah that is effectively what it was uh, but it was all done obviously democratically it wasn't all run and appointed by some far off distant ruling class uh, lackey it was done by people themselves and it was all very well organized it wasn't just a case of people picking up a weapon and, and roaming around the streets it was turn up to this place we will this committee will coordinate you will organize you send you out on patrols and then you come back and sign your weapons back in and this this kind of thing in other words it was it was done from the community itself more of a community kind of policing so yeah that kind of thing can be done working class people are perfectly capable of doing that kind of stuff if it is required by themselves they don't need to be have it enforced upon them from the outside by the ruling class mm-hmm. and the necessity of smashing the bourgeois state was, I think, first articulated by Marx and Engels in the aftermath of the Paris Commune, which was the first attempt in history to build a worker's state. Um, the, the communards, for all their courage, because they were such an early attempt, they made a series of errors. For example, they didn't seize the banks. They were insufficiently uh, organized and efficient to defend against the counter-revolution, and it was put down in blood. And it was on the basis of that experience that Marx and Engels drew the conclusion that you can't utilize a an instrument which is built in the image of the class enemy. Uh, it has to be smashed to pieces in a revolution. Yeah, that's exactly the lesson. The main lesson, one of the main lessons from the Paris Commune, is exactly that. That what's required is a worker's state to be built. You said about this business of a counter-revolution coming and, and attacking... Uh, the counter-revolution was very well prepared. Uh, they they organized themselves and they launched an attack on Paris. Meanwhile, the communards were busy agonizing over what form of democracy they should have, whether they should have democracy, whether they should have any kind of armed resistance, who should organize that. No state organization at all. Or can we just use what, what already exists? This was all the discussions that they were having instead of a, an understanding, a decisive understanding that what's required is a worker state to be built in order to resist that counter-revolution. Yeah. And, and it's a bit academic it. once Bismarck's armies have killed you all. Well, exactly, yeah, exactly. So uh, this is a really important lesson that we get from all of revolutionary history. And can we also be clear in our opposition to, for example, anarchists who are themselves revolutionaries? They tend to agree with us that capitalism needs to be smashed. Uh, and that the bourgeois state needs to be smashed, but they oppose the idea of a worker's state because they regard the state as singularly the origin of all oppression and exploitation, and that the second that communists try to build their own state, then they become just as bad as the capitalists. Yeah, I mean, that is nonsense, to be honest. And Lenin made this point, um, <clears throat> that actually what what really defines a revolutionary is not necessarily a class understanding of society or uh, the labor theory of value. All these things can be picked up, adopted by liberals or, uh, or even by representatives of the ruling class. The key defining feature of a revolutionary is an understanding of and a fighting for a defense of what Lenin called the dictatorship of the proletariat. That is, in modern language, a worker state. Today we would say we live under the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, the dictatorship of the capitalist class, the ruling class. And what we want to create is a dictatorship of the working class, of the proletariat. And that means organizing a worker state made of, yes, armed bodies of men under the control of the, the vast majority in society, that is the working class, because that's what a state is, is armed bodies of men. But under the democratic control of 
99% of society to prevent that 1% trying to exploit us and destroy lives and the planet and everything else. Those are the rights that the bourgeois claim. We reject those rights. They will fight for them because they have in every revolutionary situation throughout history. And we have to make sure that we have a worker state to defend mm. the working class against them trying to assert their right to, to exploit us and steal from us and, and all the rest of it. That is necessary. If you don't have that, if you don't have a dictatorship of the proletariat, if you don't have a worker state to defend the gains of a socialist revolution and to, to set us on the path for building a communist society, if you don't have something to defend yourself, then you risk all of the potential gains of the revolution and handing power back to the ruling class, to the capitalist class, which we're not willing to do. So is a worker's state the end goal, from our point of view? Is that where history ends, if you like? No, it's not. And, and this is a lesson also that we draw from the history of the Soviet Union, which degenerated into a Stalinist uh, dictatorship, a deformed worker's state. Because actually the end goal should be for the state to cease to exist in its entirety. Right. The point of a state, the reason for its existence, as we discussed earlier, is that it arises in a situation where there are class antagonisms, society would otherwise tear itself apart if there wasn't some kind of armed body that could defend the ruling class against the oppressed class. But if you have a society, a situation in which there is no class contradiction. Class, in fact, has been abolished through the democratic ownership of the means of production by everybody. You no longer have a society divided into owners and or possessors and non-possessors. You have a society where everyone, everyone owns everything together. You no longer have a society divided into classes. And therefore, the need for a state begin just disappears so that worker's state that we that we want to establish in order to defend the working class against the ruling class those strike committees that become organs of workers power and all the rest of it these organ these weapons these institutions of defense of the working class against the capitalist class or well, once that capitalist class ceases to exist as a class of people then the need for those organs of workers struggle organs of workers defense begins to wither away and eventually does wither away and communism therefore is a is a stateless society that's the idea well thanks so much ben am i right in thinking that you've got a bit of a legal background yourself well i did a law degree but that's as far as it goes now there we are so you've seen how the sausage is made <laughs> yeah that's right yeah. <laughs> so you can take your assessments um with even more weight all right well that was great thank you so much ben uh join us next week for a new episode of the specter of communism podcast uh, one more time thanks so much for joining us thanks for having me